particular pleasure to welcome Miranda, who came up to Sheffield from London about two years ago. Um, she's currently working on a highly prestigious Lee uh, research fellowship on blame and forgiveness. Um, so I hope she'll forgive my over effusive welcome. <laughs> um, and uh, I hand over to her with great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nothing to forgive. Um, thank you very much for coming. So I thought I would try and uh, set out some philosophical concepts which might have some use in the medical context. And I think these days in philosophy and in the humanities in general, we're constantly encouraged, in fact over-encouraged in my personal view, to try and persuade the world that our philosophical views are terribly relevant and have application. Well, sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. And a more comfortable way to proceed is to put one's concepts out there, frame a view, and then if others come forward and say, yeah, that's actually useful, that does fit my experience, or that does help in my professional practice, then great. So it's in that spirit that I'll put these ideas forward. I don't know how much the ideas of epistemic injustice will have application for people working in the medical profession, but um, some people working in the more theorised ends of medicine have started to apply them somewhat, as I shall attempt to show you. But first of all, I'll just need to explain the concepts. Um, let me... Now, let's see which arrows are going to work. Here we are. So... I think the notion of epistemic injustice, which I sort of coined in the book that I brought out in 2007 and in a few papers prior to that, has now become fairly public property and it's sort of up for grabs. So I don't say this is the definition. I can only say this is how I defined it then and to describe the main forms of epistemic injustice as I continue to understand them. Epistemic injustice really came about as a concept because of an interest in the way in which we can wrong each other, specifically in our capacities as epistemic subjects, that's to say subjects of knowledge, of belief, inquirers, aimers at truth, reasoners. When I say epistemic subject, I mean it quite broadly in that sense. Anything to do with our capacity in our relation to knowledge and truth and the presentation of reasons. Um, I think there's an obvious kind of epistemic injustice which people have always talked about quite explicitly, certainly in the political domain and in social policy, which is a distributive notion. We can ask the question, what's a fair distribution of any kind of a good? And some of those goods might be epistemic goods. So instead of asking what's a fair distribution in society of healthcare or of wealth, we might also ask what's a fair distribution in society of epistemic goods such as education, information, availability of expert opinion. Um, that isn't a kind of epistemic injustice I'm going to concentrate on today. I think it's already very well understood, um, but maybe it's useful for some people to frame those issues of uh, fair or unfair social distributions of goods in those terms. What I want to focus on is a different branch, namely uh, the discriminatory kind of epistemic injustice, and that's what my work has focused on uh, in the past. And I've outlined two different kinds of discriminatory epistemic injustice, which I hope might prove relevant to the medical context, and particular, in particular to the relationship between patients and medical practitioners and their, uh, the ways that they communicate. The first is testimonial injustice, and the second, which is a little harder to explain, hermeneutical injustice. So let me give a couple of brief definitions of those. So a brief definition of testimonial injustice. I do someone a testimonial injustice if she tells me something, and owing to some prejudice operative in the way I perceive her, perhaps it needn't be at the level of belief, but somehow some prejudice in the social atmosphere operates on my judgment so that I give her a deflated level of credibility in what she tells me. So testimonial injustice is when someone's credibility is deflated owing to prejudice. Now, although I've got a label that makes it sound like it's specifically to do with testimony, or let's say tellings, I always intended this category to, be, uh, to range over other sorts of speech acts, not just tellings, but also maybe suggestions the offering of hypotheses, the asking of a relevant question, um, airing of view, expressing an opinion, any sort of assertoric <laughs> speech act, a speech act that's roughly kind of assertion, um, 
can receive a deflated level of credibility owing to prejudice. And so that's the natural class of speech acts that it ranges over, not just testimony or tellings, but tellings are a very central case, and I had certain sorts of reasons for focusing on that central case. But as you'll see later in some of our, our examples, the relevance of someone's question in a situation of inquiry or between a patient and a medical practitioner might be the sort of speech act that can receive a deflated level of credibility owing to prejudice and therefore might be the sort of exchange where a testimonial justice can go. I think I won't talk at length about the nature of prejudice. Let me just say that in this definition, I wanted prejudice to be understood fairly broadly. Key and most important cases might be racism, ageism, sexism, um, prejudice against religious orientation, sexual orientation, all the kind of the big ones, class, accent. But there are other sorts of prejudices. It could just be that I have a certain weddedness to traditionalism in the way I assess scientific work, and that skews the way I, I perceive the merits of scientific work when I read it. That too would count as a prejudice on my definition. But perhaps the ones we might be most concerned with are the kind of socially loaded identity prejudices to do with race, class, sex, and so on. Obviously, a prejudice can decrease credibility a huge amount, or it can just decrease it a tiny amount. But depending on the situation, a tiny amount might be sufficient to actually bring the degree of credibility that one gives the speaker below the level of accepting their word. So even a small depression owing to prejudice of the credibility you give someone might be enough to mean you don't really accept what he's telling you. You prefer the other guy with you instead. So amount of deflation of credibility perhaps isn't so much the issue, it's how it relates to the border of accepting what people say. And as I want to more loosely say, taking seriously what people say. So I think that's the everyday experience I was very much trying to get at in this slightly uh, sort of telegraphic philosophical way of placing a, a strict theory on it. Many, many people for a zillion years have had the feeling that these people aren't really taking quite seriously what I'm saying. They seem to be hearing that they're not really listening. They're not really taking it on board. That's what the label of testimonial injustice was supposed to crystallize. Now, it might just be worth pointing out one further distinction within testimonial injustice, which is that it can happen after you've told me something. So you tell me something, or you offer a question, make some contribution to our discussion, and oh, some prejudice in my mind that I'm not even aware of, I didn't quite take what you said as seriously as I would have were it not for the prejudice. Or it can operate preemptively to produce what I call preemptive testimonial injustice, which is that I want to know who can tell me something I need to know. And I kind of look around and I, I don't bother asking you law. I'm interested in this one. And it's a prejudice that's making me not even want to solicit your views. I want to solicit their views, because I've got this leftist prejudice or whatever. <laughs> Switch it around. I'm really interested in your views, but not. <laughs> That's preemptive testimonial injustice. Many people have that experience, I believe, in society, but no one's really interested in me. No one seems to be in my views about things. All these discussions take place, and somehow people like me, but it's not part of the discussion. It's a form of discursive disenfranchisement to you, like it's informal, it means your views just don't come to the fore, and nobody's asking you. You're not getting the opportunity to participate in this, this kind of uh, public discourse. Okay, so testimonial injustice regular and then testimonial injustice of the preemptive kind. I hope these seem like thoroughly recognisable phenomena and as bad things to be on the receiving end of. Now, what about hermeneutical injustice? Again, uh, a brief definition just to try and get the concept on the table. I'll be talking a bit less about this than testimonial, but I, I hope it's worth uh, explaining briefly. When I was working on this, I thought to myself, well, you know, it's all very well looking at how prejudice and other sorts of relations of power can uh, have a bad effect, a prejudicial effect on people's participation in terms of giving their knowledge, giving their views to the pool of epistemic goods, it is knowledge and information, opinions and questions. But what about injustice prior to that situation? What about if you're having experiences that there aren't even sufficiently shared concepts to really make sense of. Or if there are shared concepts for you to make sense of it, and perhaps you and other members of your group to make sense of it, what if other groups out there, maybe members of which you really need to be able to communicate your experiences to, don't get it because they don't operate with those concepts? Or not in a sufficiently shared way? 
One sort of example I concentrated on, because I think it's a very clear example, is the example of sexual harassment prior to the time when that became a functioning workable phrase that picked out a phenomenon that was sort of publicly well understood. Um, perhaps now it might be useful to um, focus on a different sort of example. It seems to me probably still in cases of domestic abuse, as we now call it rather than just focusing on domestic violence, the definition's been somewhat expanded to cover emotional abuse and shouting and insulting rather than just physical abuse. Um, perhaps in cases of domestic abuse we're nearly there in uh, having sufficiently shared concepts so that someone who's on the receiving end of domestic abuse might be able to communicate his or her experiences to social services, to other members of the family or to colleagues and be understood and have those reports do what they need to do so that their experiences become more socially understood you can actually transmit them. But there might be some patches where that's not the case still for women, for young people, and I'm sure it was certainly in the cases where there wasn't physical abuse but there was emotional and verbal abuse. But perhaps a more glaring case now, men find it extremely difficult to report and be properly understood if they are being physically abused by a female partner. The reactions they often get are sort of derision, like, well, can't you can I keep your girlfriend in check? Can't you beat her up then? They're not properly understood. The idea of a physically stronger partner being physically abused by a less strong partner is not, I would su submit, sufficiently publicly understood so that a man who's having that experience will still find it's really difficult to understand his own experiences or, if he does understand them, to communicate them successfully to colleagues, peers, um, let's hope not social services, perhaps that too. So we're always in transition in the degree of sharedness of the concepts that we need to make sense of our experiences as uh, our understandings of things change and mature through history. But if you're caught in a patch of history where something you're experiencing and you need to be able to report and render intelligible to others is not intelligible to others, then you're in big trouble because you can't protest it if it's a bad thing that's happening to you. Now what I thought is, that can just be bad luck that puts one in that position. It could be that I had a, some sort of a disorder which is not yet in medical history well understood and at least with certain really difficult social experiences that I find it hard to make sense of and hard to communicate to others. And that's because my disorder is not well understood yet. But that looks a bit more like it's really bad luck. Right? I mean, it sucks, but it, it doesn't look like an injustice in itself, not an esteemed injustice. I don't, that looks like a case where I'm not being wronged in my capacity as, as, as a knower, someone who's trying to understand her experiences. But what if a significant part of the explanation why these concepts don't exist yet is not the bad luck that we haven't uh, progressed medically enough to understand it, but rather that I'm a member of a group that in general doesn't get to contribute meanings to the common store of meanings. I'm what I call hermeneutically marginalised. When that's a significant part of the explanation why there are not shared concepts for me to use to render my experiences intelligible, then that looks like, well, the odds are really unfairly stacked against me. And so where the hermeneutical difficulties are explained by hermeneutical marginalisation, that now takes on the aspect of an injustice. And that's the phenomenon I call hermeneutical injustice. And I take it that in the case of uh, women being sexually ha harassed in the particular example I've used and things I've written is in the 60s. It's from a memoir of the women's movement written by Susan Brown Miller, the women's movement in America, that is. They, she describes women getting together and having speak outs and consciousness raising groups where they literally come up with the term sexual harassment. That's it. That's what we need to call it. And before that, there wasn't a term, and I'm assuming that Women then, if not now, I suspect probably still now, but certainly then, were also members of a hermeneutically marginalised group. In general, women did not get so much as men to contribute to the common stock of meanings, modes of interpretation. And so for that reason, uh, the particular difficulty in describing the experience of sexual harassment when there wasn't a shared concept of it, counts for me as a case of hermeneutical injustice. Not just bad luck, but the odds are stacked unfairly against women at that time. So that's that's the hermeneutical injustice bit. So there, there are these two types of discriminatory epistemic injustice. And what I really want to explore in this talk is examples of whether they uh, tend to come up 
in the relationship between medical practitioners and patients. And I'm going to rely on the work of others a good deal in doing so. I think it's worth thinking momentarily about the nature of the wrong that you suffer if you find yourself suffering either testimonial or hermeneutical injustice. What's, what makes it bad? What's bad for you about finding that your word isn't taken seriously because it's a prejudice operative against people like you, or you can't express your experience properly because there's a paucity of concept from which to do so? Well, the way I theorise it is that there's an intrinsic wrong there that really constitutes the primary wrong that one's undergoing, and that is that one's being undermined in one's capacity as an epistemic subject. If you're undermined in your capacity as a knower, a reasoner, an inquirer, an asker of relevant questions, then you're undermined in a capacity that's essential to human value. And that's why even in a fairly trivial case of either testimonial or hermeneutical injustice, where there aren't many consequences for you, and yet again, someone like me isn't really taken seriously here, but what the hell, it really doesn't matter much. Even in those cases, it has, I think the phenomenology is of a sort of a pinprick, because it's inconsequential, but to one's humanity. You know the insult goes deep, even if it's not very consequential in this particular case. So that's the primary wrong. But typically with injustices that one thinks of as a fundamentally an insult, there are often secondary disadvantages which accrue to someone who's likely to be on the receiving end of either testimonial or hermeneutical injustice. Think of any practical situation. It normally matters to people for practical reasons that their word is accepted. Obvious sort of cases, if you're on trial for something, if the jury uh, uh, inflicts a testimonial injustice towards you without meaning to, of course, but somehow prejudice is deflated the level of credibility that you might be uh, convicted when you shouldn't be. You might be sent to prison when you shouldn't be. But maybe there are other sorts of more everyday problems too. Performance in a job interview, performance at work generally. Whether or not your word is taken seriously affects manifold the different sorts of social activities that we go in for. And so in that way, there'll be likely to be all sorts of practical disadvantages which are secondary to, i.e. caused by the primary wrong of being undermined or insulted in your capacity as an epistemic subject. Okay, so that's the, that's the nature of the wrong as I see it. That's why it's upsetting and seriously disadvantageous in many circumstances. Now here's a historical example from uh, medical research, a very well-known case of Ignaz Semmelweis, um, a Hungarian doctor working in the uh, Austro-Hungarian establishment in Vienna, and who famously observed a terrible um, death rate among new mothers in one of the two clinics he had uh, oversight of. In one of the clinics, um, was run by doctors, and in the other clinic was run by midwives. And in the doctor-led clinic, there was a much worse uh, rate of mortality among new mothers for, for I never had to pronounce it, poor peril fever, and it's extremely hard to say. And he was very distressed by this and could not work out how it was happening. And he famously had a, a a good idea, came up with a hypothesis that if people would wash their hands before attending to the new mothers, then that seemed to bring down the death rate enormously. And they specifically wash their hands in a, in a lime wash solution, rather like the solution you have in the household bleach. Um, what he found was, despite the fact that there was incredible empirical success, that the death rate came down absolutely massively after he instituted this practice of hand washing in hand wash solution, his theory that it was something to do with the fact that the doctors had been coming often from the morgue where they had been handling corpses and then without washing their hands moving to touch the bodies of new mothers, that this, this theory was completely rejected out of hand. And many people discussed the different possibilities for why the theory was so rejected. And Semmelweis himself reported you know, being utterly miserable at the way his views were being rejected out of hand. And people were winning prizes when they were writing books that showed why his views must be all wrong and so on. And he found it extremely 
depressing. But if we ask what the possible reasons are, as often in life, it's certainly not simple, there's all sorts of different possible explanations for why there was this massive resistance to his view, even in the face of extraordinary empirical evidence that there was something, that he was onto something. One is to do with, what, for those of you who know Thomas Kuhn's stuff in the history of science about paradigm shifts, there was a paradigm, a kind of prevailing theory about uh, uh, disease, that it was fundamentally an individual pathology. And of course, there was no germ theory yet, Pasteur's theory of germs. I'm sure many would disagree that Pasteur was the only one who came up with the theory, but canonically it's attributed to Pasteur, was in the future. So the prevailing theory about how disease was spread through miasmas in the air, the idea that someone might touch one thing and thereby transmit a bad thing to another body, was just not part of the paradigm for how these things were understood at the time at all. So what he, I mean, that just reminds you, in a way it was a really genius idea he'd had that would bring about a paradigm shift if only people had taken it up. Um, but there are other things in the background which look more like prejudices of various kinds. One is that, of course, it's a very upsetting theory to be told if you're a doctor that actually you and your touch has been the cause of the mortality of so many people. It's something that there was a natural sort of resistance to, of wanting to think that's a, that a fairly abhorrent idea. Surely not lots of the doctors who were no doubt doing their best can't be the cause of this mortality. Um, but there's another thing of a, a more identity-related prejudice, which is that Semmelweis was an outsider to the uh, Orthodox Academy. He was a Hungarian at, in Vienna at a time when Hungary was uh, militating for independence from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And uh, the suggestion is, I can't really make the suggestion on my own because I'm not a historian of medicine, but the suggestion out there is that his outside the state his outside the status, excuse me, <coughs> led his word to be held more askance by those in the establishment. Now, if these two last things, which I feel as prejudices, had a significant effect on his word being received with a deflated level of credibility, then it would be a case of testimonial injustice at work in medical research, if you like, and in medical diagnosis. Why did these women die? We've got a wrong diagnosis. But I suspect we might be more interested in contemporary examples. And I now move to work done recently by, by others, and I draw from them. Let me simply read out this case study, which is, uh, uh, I'll, I'll give you the reference in a moment when I get to the end. This is a paper now published, though this quote is actually from a conference poster. It is argued that in the diagnosis of delusional patients, there can be a tendency to overgeneralize the cognitive dysfunction of the delusional status, so that the patient is viewed as mistaken or delusional about a whole range of things which he or she, in fact, is not delusional about. So it's a, the, the proposal from these practitioners is that there's a tendency to overgeneralize, and that's a kind of prejudice in how the delusional patient is sometimes perceived. Mr. N.G. is a young African-Caribbean man in his late 20s. He's had a few years' history of contact with the mental health services with a diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder. One day, he was picked up by the police following a threat to attack another person. The police officers thought that the ideas that he was expressing and the way he was generally behaving were possibly indicative of some sort of psychiatric disorder, and they decided to bring him to a psychiatric hospital for further assessment. There, he was detained under the Mental Health Act, as he was found to be acutely psychotic, and he refused to receive treatment on a voluntary basis. On assessment of his mental health, he was found to have irritable mood, some degree of pressured speech, delusions of reference from TV, and was still expressing persecutory ideas with various contents. The one belief that was deemed delusional, and was actually the initial reason why this person was brought to the attention of the police officers and the psychiatric team, had the following content. The person that he was threatening to attack had abused a close friend of his. This was the belief that tested the testimonial sensitivity of his hearers. In further examination, it transpired that the belief about the abuse was factually true. However, as it was in the context of other irrational beliefs, such as delusions of reference and other persecutory ideas, it was assumed to be part of an extended delusional system. 
This assumption, which they suggested elsewhere, is a prejudicial assumption. Along with the fact that he had a known history of expressing irrational thoughts and having erratic behaviours, clearly put him in a position of epistemic disadvantage, causing a credibility deficit. This speaker was assumed not to have the competence to know what he's talking about, and was subsequently treated in a coercive manner on the grounds of both ethical and epistemic flaws. So this, though I've quoted it in full from the conference post of their paper, it's by Sanati and Kuretsus, it's in uh, Journal of Evaluation and Clinical Practice, I think it's forthcoming this year. So these two practitioners uh, have picked out the phenomenon of testimonial injustice prejudicial deflation of credibility as having application in the uh, assessment of delusional patients. Now, I as a philosopher would never have stood up here and said, guess what, I reckon some practitioners do this. I have no idea. I may take my cues from practitioners and say they think this is a genuine worry and something that it's worth practitioners uh, watch out for. It has the structure of testimonial injustice insofar as the, there's a prejudice at work, which these writers have suggested is a prejudice that, oh, this is a delusional patient. And so it's through that lens that all of his beliefs and cognitions are viewed, instead of being open to the evidence of whether his views were in fact correct or not. And that uh, as a result, he has the uh, deflation of credibility that's what I've called the primary wrong, but also, of course, the secondary aspect of the wrong. He's, as a result, treated coercively. So that's a typical sort of structure for a testimonial injustice. Different illustration from a paper by Javi Carell, who previously spoke in this series, and Ian Kidd, uh, which again is forthcoming, I think it's not quite out yet, um, in Medicine, Healthcare and Philosophy. I have 2014 now, but it, it may not be out yet. This is an example that they've brought in as an example of uh, a patient with a somatic illness, not a psychiatric illness. And uh, her question to the clinician is rejected out of hand. So it's not quite preemptive testimonial injustice. She has said something, she's made a contribution and it receives a deflated level of credibility in terms of its rele relevance. Remember I said at the beginning that testimonial injustice I'd always intended to apply to other speech acts besides tellings and questions are a really useful uh, case plan. That's a paper by my colleague Chris Hookway who explicitly suggested in, in a classroom situation that judgments of the relevance to the collective inquiry that a particular student might uh, make are uh, classic locus for prejudice, prejudicial deflation of credibility, and uh, I agree with them. And this is an example from a medical context. The patient says this I asked a professor whether being exposed to reduce oxygen levels long term the way I am would have any detrimental effects on cognitive function, e.g., would that explain why my memory had rapidly become much worse? He just laughed off my genuine and serious concern by saying he had the same problem and sometimes couldn't even remember his wife's name. I never did get a proper reply to that question. So again, they've put forward this um, as an example, but it's from, as it were, out of, out of the mouth of a, at the mouth of a patient. And so I take my cues from them. What about hermeneutical injustice? Um, more complex phenomenon, but I think we can find, again this time from the... Uh, autobiography of the women's liberation movement that Susan Brown Miller gives us, a little example of it. She's relating this, so back in the early 60s, she's relating the experience of a woman who had what we would now readily call postnatal depression, but who at the time could not find the concepts and they weren't sufficiently shared concepts to put a name to it and understand it properly and get it diagnosed. So Brown Miller accounts, Wendy Sanford, born into an upper-class Republican family, was battling depression after the birth of her son. Her friend, Esther Rome, dragged her to the second MIT session. This is a, a conscious and crazy session. Wendy had kept her distance from political groups. I walked into the lounge, she recalls, and they were talking about masturbation. I didn't say a word. I was shocked. I was fascinated. At a later session, someone gave a breastfeeding demonstration. Well, that didn't shock me. But then we broke down into small groups. 
I'd never broken down into a small group in my life. In my group, people started talking about postpartum depression. In that one 45 minute period, I realized that what I'd been blaming myself for, and what my husband had blamed me for, wasn't my personal deficiency. It was a combination of physiological things and a real societal thing, isolation. Now for me, that counts as an example of hermeneutical injustice, just if the following <coughs> conditions apply. That she's a member of a hermeneutically marginalized group, which I take it women in the 1960s were. They, this is in a sense a real example of it, that she hadn't before had the chance to try and put, explore concepts and put her experiences out there to acquire and generate shared ways of understanding them. That's what consciousness raising groups do. They invite people, they give people a safe space in which to, with fumbling words, come to better words, better ways of describing what their experiences are. Now, if she's a member of a hermeneutically marginalized group, and that that partly explains why this idea, this diagnosis, ready-made diagnosis of what we now so easily call postnatal depression wasn't really available to her, then that looks like a case of hermeneutical injustice. And if so, then it's a question of you know, medical diagnosis being compromised by the uh, situation of hermeneutical injustice. And you'll notice that hermeneutical injustice, unlike testimonial injustice, doesn't have a perpetrator. No one perpetrates hermeneutical injustice on Wendy, I can't remember her second name now. It's a structural difficulty whose roots are really the differentials of power relations which explain why this lot are hermeneutically marginalised while that lot aren't. And so this lot will put it unfairly increased risk of having important social experiences they need to be able to communicate but can't. That's really the structure of the injustice. So in a way what talking about both kinds of epistemic injustice has done is to insist that it's not just political participation and uh, social participation and economic and material participation which are useful, valuable social practices that everyone needs to get a fair crack at. There's also epistemic participation, and of various kinds, hermeneutical participation of generating meanings which are taken up by the collective, and just the giving of your views. This too is a way of uh, participating in an epistemic practice, which if you're marginalized from it, you're unfairly disadvantaged. Now here's an illustration of a kind of compound case not completely neat for me, I think, but it's a sort of mixture of testimonial and hermeneutical injustice. Again, Carol and Kip present it uh, as a case of, I think they just call it epistemic injustice, but I, I see it as a, a, a combination of both specific kinds. They are talking, they're quoting from uh, an account given by someone who had a history of psychiatric ill health called Ellen Sachs. And she uh, gives her account of rushing to hospital with symptoms of brain damage. Quickly, they bundled me into the car and took me to the emergency room. So we're in, we're in America again. Where a completely predictable disaster happened. The ER discovered I had a psychiatric history. And that was the end of any further diagnostic work. Poor Maria was literally jumping up and down, trying to tell anyone who'd listen that she'd seen me psychotic before and that this was different. But her testimony didn't help. I was a mental patient. The ER sent me home. And that's one of various other examples they give of having a history of psychiatric ill health, pushing someone with a special disadvantage of physical illness, just going undiagnosed or perhaps misdiagnosed. And I think that's a very interesting sort of intersection. Um, let's unpack it for a moment. Um, obviously, embedded here is a uh, testimony by the patient as well as by her friend and relation, Maria, who's testifying on her behalf. And she, both of them presumably are saying, this is not a psychotic episode, it's something different. And they're simply not believed. And the, it fits the structure insofar as, the, I can't know for sure, but insofar as it's a prejudice that someone with men, a history of mental illness is bound to be doing these things wrong. But that, through that prejudicial lens, her protestations about her current symptoms were being viewed. And so the testimony, this is not a psychotic episode, there's something else wrong, is rejected uh, out of hand and receives a deflated level of credibility. Insofar as that's what went on, then it's a testimony of injustice. Why have I thought of it as also a case of hermeneutical injustice? Well, insofar as this is the case, 
that someone in that situation with a history of mental ill health, if you think they count as a member of a group which is hermeneutically marginalised, and certainly I've had, I don't really know how we should think about that, but certainly I've had some people say to me who themselves have a history of mental ill health and say, we, we count as such a group. One is hermeneutically marginalised when one, one, one has mental illness. You don't get to contribute to the shared store of concepts and interpretive tropes nearly as much as the mentally healthy do. If that's the case, if that's the right lens through which to view it, then Ellen Sachs was a member of a hermeneutically marginalised group. And if part of this experience she had was that how it is to have psychotic episodes, that there are psychoses and then you have clarity that you're not in one now, if that range of experiences cannot be conveyed successfully to the powers that be, in this case people in the ER room, because there isn't sufficient shared concepts and shared modes of understanding, then she's experiencing exactly the hermeneutical injustice as, as I define it. A kind of conceptual hermeneutical gap that's caused significantly by the fact that she's a member of a hermeneutically marginalised group. So it looks like there's both kinds of epistemic injustice at work in this same example. Now, really what I've done so far is explain the concepts and then draw on other people's work and experiences to try and suggest that they have application in patients' experiences and sometimes in their attempts to communicate to medical practitioners. Now I just want to, uh, in a sense, sympathise with the incredibly difficult predicament of the medical practitioner and offer a little a way of thinking about it which might be useful. In a sense, um, someone whose job it is is to be an expert in diagnosis, among other things, and to have responsibility for care, and to exercise that responsibility and exercise that expertise under conditions of incredible pressure of time and stress and extreme high stakes because often it's a situation of life and death and so on. Um, it's a in a very difficult situation. And one way of thinking about the epistemic dimension of difficulty is to contrast two different stances that any of us have when we are trying to learn from somebody else what is the case. For instance, what's wrong with them or what their experiences are. One is a stance of trust where we don't find out for ourselves, we just take their word for it. We do that all the time every day when you ask me the time I tell you, or you know, Ian asked me when I came to Sheffield on the sets two years ago. He doesn't go off and check and regard me as a body of evidence that he needs to assess. He just takes my word for it. The stance is one of trust. The other stance that we often take towards each other, entirely legitimately and without any disrespect, is to regard each other as bodies of evidence. If Ian came in here shaking an umbrella, completely soaking, I might infer from his role in the state of affairs I'm observing, which is a body of evidence, that it's been raining. In that sense, he functions for me as a mere source of information, part of a body of evidence, and there's no trust relations involved. I, I merely, he's really, he's a bundle of features, a bundle of bits of evidence from which I infer certain things. That's all right, no, just, no disrespect in treating each other that way, we do it all the time. But there are kind of norms that involve epistemic respect about when and where and how much to treat each other as just bundles of evidence, bundles of symptoms, if you like, and when to take up a stance of trust. Now, when a doctor is talking to a patient, I take it she needs to speak to the patient in a way that will involve the stance of trust, at least over trivial things. You know, when did you get here? How were you feeling yesterday, etc., etc. And doctors regularly do that. But then there's, a, and then at the other end, when it comes to the interpretation of symptoms and so on, the doctor needs to just treat one as a body of evidence, as look at one's symptoms and make inferences which, as an expert, she's able to make, but me as a patient, I'm not able to make. That's, that's her job. I want her to do that. So the doctor has to move between a stance of trust and a stance of evidence very nimbly. Now actually we all do, actually we all do, because whenever somebody tells you something, you ask someone the time or whatever it is, if they kind of can't really see their watch properly or kind of go like this, you might pick up on cues for, is her watch actually 
work. And so you switch from a start to trust it. Maybe I should verify. The evidence, Miranda says it's quarter two, but actually she doesn't look that sure. I'm going to verify. I'll look at the clock too. We, as any, any responsible epistemic subject, and as it were, taker in a testimony, must be able to have that nimble movement between the starts of trust and the starts of checking, the starts of evidence, where instead of handing over the epistemic responsibility to the other person, I'm not going to check, I'll just take it from you, I take back the responsibility myself, and I do go and check, and I make sure. But doctors have to do that in an especially difficult circumstance, because of how high the stakes are, and how uh, pressured the time is, and how delicate so many of the things that need to be said are. And so it, it's very understandable that there are special difficulties for a medical practitioner in terms of avoiding treating patients as bundles of symptoms. You need to keep on, as it were, taking the stance of trust where appropriate, but not, um, not of course, allow the trusting stance to permeate where it shouldn't, because at the end of the day, as an expert, the doctor must take full epistemic responsibility for the diagnosis that she gives. And there's no way at all that she's supposed to trust the patient about that. She's there as an expert. That's part of her responsibility. And so we can see a sort of vice of epistemic shirking that the doctor has to avoid. At the end of the day, it's her call. And yet at the same time, there's another vice at the other end where she doesn't trust enough. And she's just viewing the patient as a bundle of symptoms, as I sort of viewed... Ian as a bundle of wet person coming in. Well, that was all right, but if it's a patient who's telling you uh, how she's felt and uh, that, you know, she had a shereen in a psychotic episode, etc., etc., it may be that somewhat of a stance of trust is required in that moment of accepting her testimony. And so the doctor has to keep shifting in these very difficult circumstances. And I, I, I wonder whether, I don't know whether that's a useful idea for medical practitioners to have, that they have a sort of, there's a sort of professional epistemic virtue to be sought out, which is, in an old-fashioned Aristotelian way, the mean between two extremes of too little trust and too much trust. We've got to avoid epistemic shirking and avoid epistemic objectification, where she's just regarding the patient's abundant symptoms. A piece of meat, as people often say. And in the middle, there's this suitably nimble facility to trust where appropriate, but to go check and regard as evidence where appropriate. And that's an extremely difficult balance to be had, especially in high stakes situations where at the end of the day the buck stops with you. So I merely offer that as my, my last thought about the, the predicament the medical practitioners are in and whether we think it's useful I think there's a kind of virtue as a mean involved here that we might think of as a virtue of epistemic justice that's a, a particularly important one uh, within the profession of medicine. Thank you very much. Thank you, that was fabulous. I'm hoping there'll be some questions, but um, I'm very happy to start with the first. Um, I sometimes see people who life experiences have led them to believe that they themselves have nothing to say or contribute or are intrinsically worthless or that their voice should not be heard. I think about people who've had very traumatic upbringings or been victims of sexual abuse. And in that setting the problem is, is that they themselves are not even able to or feel unable to offer their own experience and it makes it very difficult to access what's been happening to them. Often get the story eventually only after a number of years of knowing someone in one setting. How do you classify that? Because that is they're clearly in a way a victim of injustice. It's not it's been done to them, but not within the relationship in which that's manifest. It's been done to them five, ten, fifty years before. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean the it always seems a bit glib to sort of put these philosophical classifications on complex and, and terrible situations, but it, for me, it's a case of self-imposed testimony of injustice. So, like, like all, um, well, many, many kinds of injustice can be done to oneself. Um, one can uh, discriminate against oneself in various ways, for instance, if perhaps despite my better beliefs, I uh, don't go up for some job because I'm a woman, or I don't speak out say my views because I'm a woman. I'm allowing the sense of discrimination to enter my own head. In that sense, I'm discriminating against myself. 
Some people say that um, certain sorts of sex work amount to self-exploitation. So similarly, with epistemic injustice, there's a category available, which is that you know, we often do it to ourselves. And um, in that case, of course, what's been done to the person, the, who they're a victim of is the people who abuse them or made them feel like this in the first place. That's another whole bundle of injustices right there. But in terms of the epistemic injustice, which may be often, you know, the least important in, injustice in the room, as it were. But if we're focusing on that, then it looks like a kind of case of auto testimonial injustice. Here I am, my lawyer doesn't really count, so maybe I won't even offer it. Have you ever tried to offer those thoughts to people who are the victims of those situations? I, I haven't, and perhaps I wouldn't, but, um, but if someone who has the expertise to talk to people properly who have those experiences found it a useful way of framing it, then that would be great. I mean, I suspect psychologists and psychiatrists and clinicians intrinsically do it, but without necessarily using the formal language, where we're trying to give value to people's voices. Yeah. I was going to say, um, what do you think about theories of learned helplessness, um, where it's not so much that they don't buy their own opinion, but it's had no impact and therefore they don't want to use it? What's not had, so what didn't have impact? Their voice. Oh, their voice hasn't had impact and therefore it's nice to um, It sounds, I mean, structurally, it sounds very similar to the sort of case that Ian was talking about, um, except with Ian's case, it wasn't so much helplessness as loss of self-esteem that was doing it. But maybe in learned helplessness, in a particular case, it might have to be that loss of self-esteem. Could you give me a particular case where it happens? Um, I'm more thinking that studies with animals where the um, where they may uh, shock an animal and when it's jumped to a place of safety and then also gets the shock again, it then just lies down and takes the shocks because oh, it's um, there's no more for it to go to, so sort of learned helplessness mm. and cases of abuse where there's the, their action to escape has not led to any beneficial outcomes. Mm. They stop showing that behaviour. Yes. Um, I mean, I always think it's important for any passion of philosophy to be careful not to overreach itself. I mean, these structures I was offering is specifically about something epistemic, so it's about beliefs and knowledge and in the context of someone offering them to another, or maybe not bothering to offer them to another because their work's not solicited and so on. It looks to me like what you're describing is certainly a behavioural analogue, um, and that's very useful, but I wouldn't try and kind of appropriate those sorts of cases into the epistemic because it may be lots of behaviours, certainly of animals, but even when human beings behave in those ways, those sorts of learned behaviours, they might not match up with people that have seen states at all. It might be that somebody knows very well the X or Y, but still they behave differently. Thank you. Um, just an, an observation and then a question. Um, your Semmelweis historical example made me think of John Snow and the removal of the Broad Street pump and the cholera outbreak, which was very perfectly accepted. And that was also when the miasma was the extant paradigm. Uh -huh. And that would lend, as a comparator, I think, more credence to the last two um, statements that you suggested that might have been um, influential in the response to some of uh -huh. just that. Thank you. Um, but because they, they, they didn't apply think to John, to John Snow. Um, question, um, just trying to think about other examples of um, testimonial injustice. Um, is the institutional marginalization of a whistleblower an example of testimonial injustice? And then being very self to this position, I'm thinking of a reverse situation where I will say something to a patient and I know they're not taking on what I'm saying. A very obvious example might be, I'm saying, I don't think you need an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. And they are not hearing me. And that leads to a sense of frustration. Um, and I'm just wondering, is that an example of testimonial injustice? And if it is, 
maybe that's just a helpful way to to view that when it comes back to you as a, a help for a first sense of frustration. Mm. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, so the example of a physician saying to someone they really don't need antibiotics is better than the happen and, and they're demanding them. Similar sort of example might be someone wanting sleeping pills in the room. Um, is a great one because it was a lovely example of how difficult it is to have the virtue of epistemic justice in that case because there are all these, uh, as it were, different pressures at work and it's a case where it looks like the physician really does need to stand back, really not trust, <laughs> despite the pressures and despite the sort of readiness with which some people might say, my doctor didn't listen to me, I needed this, but you say, actually no, and that would be a good case of, of succeeding in, in, in having the virtue. But also, yes, it would be a case of, of testimonial justice insofar as it's the prejudice at work on the part of the patient. So one thing I've always been troubled by is that I, in carving out this concept of testimonial injustice, I was always very concerned to make sure that the cases that it captured were definitely injustices, because there's nothing worse than the theory of injustice that casts its net too wide and everything looks unfair. You need to really focus on important cases. For that reason, I focused only on cases where prejudice was at work. But I've often wondered since then whether actually it would be really worth expanding the case a bit, because imagine your case and let's just stipulate that the patient wasn't prejudiced. She was just being really demanded. She just really wanted it. She wasn't really thinking further than that, as it were. And uh, so there was no prejudice against the doctor in thinking, he won't give me what I need, he doesn't care. It was simply make, the making of demand. In a way, that ought to count as a testimonial injustice, because your word would be getting a deflation of credibility in an unfair way. But the unfair route isn't specifically a prejudice, it's some other kind of unfairness. And since writing this stuff, various other people have suggested other ways in which the distribution of credibility, if you like, can be very unfair, and the odds can be stacked against certain people, but there isn't quite a prejudice at work anywhere. And so I, so I, so I just leave it with you. It would be a case of testimonial injustice if your patient was prejudiced, but maybe it should be a case of sort of variant testimonial injustice, even if the unfairness was taking a different form. But as long as there's a kind of unfairness to the credibility deflation, then it certainly looks uh, like it should be in, 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 the, uh, in the cluster of epistemic injustices. So that's a slight adjustment to your definition? It would be, yes, yes. I mean, I, I'm, I'm open to that. So, yeah, the strict answer about my definition is it depends whether there's a prejudice or not. I guess what I've experienced it is when people perceive that the physician is part of an intellectual elite and an establishment and that their views of some form of complementary or alternative medicine which yes. the physician might not support are being dismissed because of a intellectual elitism rather than on the basis of evidence yes. and then, then actually the physician's knowledge is being inappropriately dismissed. Yes, yes. The trouble is physicians are totally capable of being arrogant and idiotic and being their own worst enemies sometimes. Being humans. Yes. I was thinking of Richard Dole's, um, you know, when Richard Dole first described smoking as the cause of lung cancer, he was widely dismissed. I mean, it's just human nature throughout. Mm. Um, then, um, um, in your talking about the mechanism of hermeneutical injustice, you focus very much on um, hermeneutical marginalisation. Be able to participate in the shaping of the problem. Um, but I wonder whether it's the flip side of hermeneutical marginalization would be hermeneutical privilege. And I wonder whether you think, in, particularly in the medical context, there's much use to look at that as being a, um, something worth focusing on or with, with, uh, could be ended uh, uh, up you know, just itself, you know, particularly given sort of a lot of criti critiques of medicalization can be read very naturally as claims of political injustice, saying that when medicine dares to speak on a topic, it's then seen as having the last word on it because it has such a, um, a, an authority. And when someone says depression is a it's neurological process and therefore it rules out talking about sort of social uh, causes or uh, 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 sort of similar problems. Um, and so question, do you think that do you have any privilege as well as much as it used to be to do? And if so, what would sort of the practical lessons for health workers be if they do have a disproportionate, have privilege um, in shape when they speak up? Yeah, 
Thank you very much. Now, I'm sure that's absolutely right that if one wanted to gain increased critical understanding of, if you like, which discourses are in the ascendancy and which aren't, you've got to look at both. You've got to look at privilege and marginalisation because there, there's always a kind of balance there. When I first theorised this stuff, I wanted to focus on um, specifically on marginalisation, partly because I wanted hermeneutical injustice to be a category that would apply to cases even where there wasn't any kind of prevailing ideology that was doing the act of marginalisation, certainly. So I think a case of hermeneutical injustice might be uh, sort of age-related, say. So take teenagers in the 1950s, just, you know, that's when they were invented, right? Teenagers, <laughs> they didn't really exist before they were with children. The teenagers start having experiences with adolescents, um, early relationships, rock and roll, pop music, all this kind of revolutionary stuff. It was all sort of being invented there. Not all sorts of experiences that they couldn't possibly explain to their parents. And that's a part of what defined the 60s, right? It was this clash of incomprehension between two generations. Now, insofar as one might think that teenagers were hardly to be marginalised then, God knows I don't think they are anymore, but I suppose they <laughs> were then, then that's a case of unusual marginalisation, but it would be a sort of over-politicisation, I think, to, to regard adults as somehow uh, being the privileged, on the privileged end of a political ideology that would keep the young people down if wanted to be open. But normally, I, I think, uh, you know, where someone is, where, where this group is marginalised, that's because the other lot are kind of enjoying their privilege, thank you very much, and we like the way we discuss things, and we like our concepts, and that's all working fine for us. It can be a conspiracy, it can just be comfort and power. There's no, nothing's forcing them to revise their concepts or to listen differently or so on. So I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, last question. <clears throat> From the first question, I think the perspective of um, practitioners who's constantly making um, decisions and medical assumptions are part of that. At what point does medical assumptions become um, prejudice from, from your concepts of injustice? Yeah. yeah, thank you. I really do not know the answer to that question. Let me, <laughs> let me say what, how, let me give an answer, um, which is to explain a bit more how I've been using the word prejudice, but then, only you would be able to make what's inevitably a very substantive judgment as to whether certain sorts of medical assumptions count as fitting that definition or not. Um, but the way I use the notion of prejudice, it has to involve um, a certain sort of motivated resistance to counter evidence, or actually that's, that's really just the core case. What it really involves is some kind of motivated, i.e. by desire, some wanting to stick with a certain view of the world, a motivated maladjustment to the evidence. Very often that will be a resistance to counter evidence, but it might also be that um, generalizations are formed onto a smaller body of evidence, for instance. Or it might be that there's a certain avoidance of situations in which counter evidence might arise. Maybe, maybe not, to, uh, as it were, a very strongly motivated avoidance. The motivation could be laziness or, you know, I haven't got time to go around the world seeing how it is for everybody else. I'm just going to keep on doing things my same way. In a sense, that would count for me as prejudice. So it shows how difficult it is to not be prejudiced. So it remains an epistemic notion. There's a kind of epistemic fault at work whenever I think in a prejudiced way. It involves a motivated maladjustment to the evidence. Um, now, it's going to be a matter of substantive empirical argument in any given case, whether a certain set of presumptions that you might make about a particular patient count as prejudice. Is it, is it, we've been reminded already from Ian's comment that some people think that insisting on evidence-based evidence medicine is a prejudice, and others say, no, that's not you know. So that's going to remain contentious, but at least if that's a clear enough definition of the idea of prejudice, then we know what we're arguing. Does is that, that useful? Yeah, so just to clarify that, so it doesn't matter where all those prejudices are, the multitude of them, um, but it's the fact that, that the context which they've been put into is always collectively, collectively right. If it's collectively right, then the print, and there haven't been um, ignorances going on, literally, that's that, then the prejudice isn't there. Is that, is that what you're saying? If it's adequate to the evidence, then it can't be prejudiced. 
People with all the, the information and best will in the world might disagree about whether something is empirically supported by evidence enough to be a premise that you proceed on. But um, so that's going to remain controversial. But at least the notion of prejudice is one of the failure to have the correct orientation towards the evidence, where that failure is partly explained by a kind of uh, close-mindedness or or, or overgeneralization. So because we make mistakes vis-à-vis the evidence all the time, which are just inevitable because we're not rationally infinite. So there's kind of innocent error all the time. And you know, one might act, you know, through error, slightly overgeneralize. But if there's not any kind of closeness to the evidence that's part of the motivation that explains it, then it won't count as prejudice, it'll just count as an error. But see, I often see the opposite, where that same train of thinking ends up in a wrong diagnosis because um, like a computer might actually, oh I mustn't ignore that, mustn't ignore that, mustn't ignore that. And they come to a diagnosis of an extreme having missed the obvious before. Yeah. Which is when looking at computer decision making and the yes. development of this kind of computer to become a doctor for example yes. has, has so far yeah. failed. I see. So that's really interesting from the point of view of what you're saying. Yeah. So the ways in which a responsible diagnoser will relate to the evidence will can't be in the manner of a computer work. We see patterns, don't we? And I remember going to a, a dermatologist years ago. I had some funny molly thing that you know might have been dodgy and then turned out not to be. And actually, he was a classic because I'm sure he was completely brilliant, and I really loved going to him. Perhaps part of this was because I was completely non-worried. But he absolutely treated me like I was not there at all. And he spoke in words that I couldn't really understand and told me what it was, and then didn't explain it at all. It was so old school, it was hilarious. And, but I, since it was a situation where for me, that just didn't matter for me at all. I just, I wasn't anxious. I just needed to trust this expert's judgment. I was quite happy to barely be related to as a human being and not be explained to. And I think I said, can you just tell me, can you write that down for me, <laughs> or something like that. And I said, how do you, how do you know, because he had a look at it, and he said, and then he really thought very carefully and said, all I can really say is that I've been looking at these for so many years, I can tell. And I thought, brilliant. I, that's exactly, and I knew just what he meant, and I think this that pattern seeing, perhaps, that you're talking about, so as he was talking about it in a diachronic way of seeing similar things over many, many years, whereas you're talking about a pattern synchronic in the now and how, which things you prioritise. But it's sort of that pattern seeing that must be a really crucial part of good diagnosis. And I don't think anything I've said about prejudice and so on relates very directly to that. But certainly any substantive arguments about what counts for prejudice or not needs to be nuanced to that. So if someone who's an experienced practitioner says, I don't care what the damn computer's saying, I just reckon this is one of those, this is the important bit, then you should listen to that because this isn't to be understood as a prejudice straight away, to be understood in the context of that practitioner having seen many, many of those over the years, or whatever it might be. I think I'd love to carry on chatting with these drawers to a close, um, and thank Miranda again for a wonderful lecture, and um, see you all perhaps in three weeks time for the last of this conversation.